Greetings everyone, this is the pesticide and herbicide lecture. And when we came from the last lecture, which is looking at monoculture, I wanted to think about, okay, we know that there are so many pests, mainly insects and fungus, but um, there's plenty of pests that are affecting our food crops because there's so much food available in these monoculture fields. Um, so if we still want to do that, then we need to be using pesticides if we want to be able to feed our planet um, or have any hope of feeding our planet, essentially. So um, I, there's you know different ways we can think about pesticides. There are some good things about pesticides. Certainly not you know this old ad, DDT is good for me, right? Um, we know that there are bad things about pesticides, but there are also good things about pesticides. Now the good things, let's start with that. Um, it's estimated that if we were to not use pesticides on a global scale, 40%, 42% of our food would be lost. Now that is with current practices of how we grow things, but um, you know, if, if all of a sudden we're like, okay, no more pesticides, we would have a world food problem, right? Um, so it's it's we'll talk it, it leads to this idea about economic dependence essentially on pesticides um our global food economy and the lives of you know most of the people on the planet then would are dependent on using pesticides it's also cost effective to use pesticides so when there is a pest problem for every one dollar that you spend, that every one dollar a farmer spends on pesticides, they gain about four dollars back. Okay, so that's because you know not every field has a pest problem all the time. So um, that's why we see that one to four return on investment. Because we're using pesticides and we're not losing forty-two percent of our food that we produce, it means we have less land that we need to used to grow things. So that means less invasion into natural habitats. That means um, just overall less impact, overall less carbon being put into the atmosphere, less plowing is needed, and less than, than erosion. So all of these things kind of go together to, to say that we have this economic dependence on pesticides. Now, there are some good things and bad things about that. We probably have more people on the planet, fewer people are dying from food, um, from basically starvation because of it, but there's also some really bad things. So uh, the rest of this lecture I kind of wanted to spend some time thinking about why pesticides and herbicides are um, not so great to use. The anti kind of pesticide, herbicide um, movement started in the, the early 60s because if we think about like post-World War II we started using pesticides at, with, at, uh, to great effect all over the world especially in the United States and um, we didn't start seeing the or recognizing the um, impacts of that until later in again the 60s so Rachel Carson she wrote a book called Silent Spring it was a huge bestseller and it imagined basically a world without tweeting birds because um, what we see is that the, the the main pesticide this book was kind of uh, attacking and, and trying to get rid of was DDT DDT is a uh, pesticide that works really well for killing all sorts of types of insects and it was applied to great effect all over the US helping food sources all over. The thing is that DDT was really bad for birds. It, if a bird was exposed to high DDT levels, their, their bird the eggshells would get really fragile. And here's a picture of some bald eagle eggs that have been exposed to, or the, the mother eagle was exposed to DDT, had high DDT levels in her body, and these eggs really started to die. Now the reason why um, DDT was high in bald eagles is because bald eagles are um, fish-eating birds. That's one of their main uh, food sources. And what happens is that DDT is a persistent chemical, so that makes it good to be a pesticide because you can apply it once and it stays 
um, active and killing the, the pests, pests for a long time, but that means that it goes into the water, it gets washed downstream, and it goes through this thing called biological magnification. So if you look at it, in the water there's really not that much DDT. This is parts per million. So for one part of water, so one molecule of water, or so for a million molecules of water there is 0 .000, wait, 0 0.000003 parts of DDT. So you need a whole lot of water to even get like one molecule of DDT. But the thing is, whenever DDT gets put into a cell, into an organism, it stays there forever. So as zooplankton, these are tiny little um, animals in the water, are exposed to DDT, all of that basically stays in their body for the, their whole life. So the small fish then, small fish are eating um, these tiny little zooplankton and they, um, they will increase the amount of DDT in their bodies. Bigger fish then eat those small fish. So we start to see, you know, if, if a large fish over its life eats a thousand, two thousand fish or whatever, smaller fish, all of that DDT in those smaller fish will now be in that big fish. And then how over the life of a, this is an osprey or a bald eagle or something, how many fish, are, bigger fish are they eating? And we can get things pretty high concentrations here of 25 parts per million. So you get a DDD concentration increase of about 10 million times when you go, when it goes through the food chain. So uh, and DDT doesn't just affect uh, fish eating birds, it affects all type of birds essentially, but the, the, the effects were most apparent in fish eating birds. And this book, The Silent Spring, uh, really started the anti-pesticide movement. In 19, 1972, DDT was banned in the U.S. Uh, pretty much most of the world has uh, followed suit. There's a couple countries in Africa that still use DDT for uh, protecting against malaria, but it's being phased out pretty, um, pretty, pretty well. Unfortunately, Rachel Carson, two years after the publication of her book, died of breast cancer. Some some people might think it is actually exposure to pesticides and um, things that actually killed her and gave her breast cancer. But so uh, I want to stay with this idea of, of DDT for a little bit longer. Um, and so it, what, one of the flagship species of, of the United States is the bald eagle, right? It's our national bird and all the symbols everywhere, right? And what we see is um, bald eagles were really common in the late 1800s as um, a lot of water quality decreased and killed a lot of the fish. What we see is bald eagles are become really rare. Uh, we're using DDT then kind of World War II and on, and the numbers get really, really low, okay? It's listed as an endangered species in the 60s. DDT is banned sometime, or 19, what was it? I forget, 1972. And then what we see is right after that DDT ban, not surprisingly, bald eagles increase dramatically. So we're seeing then that um, bald eagles now you can find pretty much all, all over the place. Their populations have rebounded. The thing is you can still actually find DDT in their systems because they still ha are experiencing this um, biomagnification because the, the chemicals have not completely disappeared from their environments. So. DDT has been banned and it's been a success story that um, kind of companies that are making pesticides are a little bit more cognizant of what their their pesticides are doing so we no longer use really persistent chemicals um, we use pesticides that you know are, are applied kill the bugs and then get broken down into non-harmful um, things relatively quickly. At least that's what it's supposed to happen. And what we see though is, you know, in the last 30 years or so, the 
amount of pesticides has only increased, right? And uh, one of the biggest things is this neonicotinoids. It's basically a um, insecticide that is uh, synthetically made based on the nicotine chemical. Um, nicotine is, you know, naturally found in tobacco plants and is allows basically only or it doesn't allow any insects to be able to eat the, the tobacco plant. It kills anything it touches except the tobacco hornworm, but you know, that that's only one species that can tolerate nicotine. So we have started to, you know, co opt that strategy and use these neonicotinoids in our pesticide um, applications of today. The thing is, what we're seeing is um, our insect populations are really, really decreasing. So there was a study that came out in, oh, I forget when it was, 2017, that was looking at um, insect populations, and they found that 75% of insects are declining in this, this was kind of the first paper that looked at it in, it was in um, natural areas in Germany. And so people took notice of this. A 75% decline in insects is a, kind of a big deal. Um, and the, so since in the last couple of years, they've been spending a lot of time by looking at different natural areas and seeing if there is an insect decline. Um, and what we have been finding is that it's really, really hard to detect, right? So this, these, uh, some of these scientists are calling this the insect apocalypse. And um, what we're seeing is there's a problem with this shifting baseline syndrome. Now this is the idea that it's really hard to, essentially people's memories are short. So it's really hard to figure out what was normal. And so this is an analogous scenario where um, this is, you know, this certain uh, boat that would go out and catch fish. And in the 50s, they were catching groupers that were bigger than people, right? In the 60s and 70s, the fish are no longer bigger than the fishermen. In the 80s, it's all a different species and snappers. And now in the 2000s, the fish are pretty, pretty small. Um, so when you apply this to insects, it's even harder because nobody really knows, has real good data on insects, and nobody knows what, how many insects were in one area, so it's hard to figure that out. Um, it's also hard to get people excited about bugs, and they're like, yeah, I meant less mosquitoes. But the whole... Um, whole thing is what we're seeing is a massive insect decline throughout pretty much every type of species. So every type of insects. These are caddisflies, butterflies, beetles, bees, mayflies, dragonflies, snowflies, all pretty much across the globe. What it's estimated is that we've in the just the last 10 years lost about 41% of our insects across the planet. And this is only starting to get some press since maybe from 2017 is kind of when it started. I'm starting to see more and I've seen more articles in the uh, following years, but it is still relatively uncommon to see much press about this. Um, but we're calling this the insect apocalypse and um, it's kind of an interaction between two things. They think it's the the um, interaction between climate change and the use of these neonicotinoid pesticides. Neonicotinoids are extremely toxic to insects and when you combine that with heat stress and climate change, um, issues with climate change, it's really hammering these insect populations really strongly. And one of the ways we're seeing this is with insect eating bird declines. The, the birds that are like their diet is completely insects, those pretty much across the world are really, really decreasing. So now let's switch gears a little bit and think about um, 
this other type of problem that we see with pesticides, which is endocrine disruptors. So your endocrine system is your hormones, so testosterone, estrogen, all sorts of different things. Um, any type of hormone that you have in your body, that's your endocrine system. Okay, growth hormone, all sorts of things. Now what we see is different chemicals then can interfere with that. That is these endocrine disruptors. Um, and so, you know, as babies, if they're exposed to these endocrine disruptors, they can cause big problems later on in life. Atrazine is um, one of these endocrine disruptors. It's banned in the European Union, but it's one of the most common herbicides in the U.S. And you can see this is um, atrazine use here in the United States, where is it used basically where we're growing wheat, right? This is the most commonly detected pesticide in drinking water, but what it does is it attacks the endocrine disruptor and it turns basically testosterone into estrogen. So it can turn boy fish into girl fish. It can turn male frogs into female frogs. People that are exposed to it long term can have a condition called gynecomastia, which is basically breast development in, women, in men. So obviously it's a bad thing and um, there have been a lot of researchers that have been trying to ban atrazine. Um, atrazine is a the, the most common herbicide used for that the, they apply to corn to try to help corn get rid of weeds, right? Uh, but there's even more common uh, endocrine disruptors than, than you might think. So antibacterial soap, one of the most common antibiotics, triclosan, is an endocrine disruptor. So um, I don't use antibacterial soap because I don't want to be turning boy fish into girl fish. But um, so, so some of the answers to this is why doesn't everybody eat organic, right? And well, organic food is expensive, so it's not totally doable there. Um, it's also uh, what, what, you know, we wouldn't have enough food on the planet with current, like, agricultural practices at least, um, if we, everybody ate organically. And even organic doesn't mean pesticide free, right? So some people you actually use nicotine on organic food, on organic plants, because um, it's extracted from the tobacco plant, a natural tobacco plant, it's a natural chemical, so they can still call it organic. So when you see this USDA organic symbol on foods, um, that doesn't really mean organic. There's plenty of pesticides that are found from native sources. The Sabadia, Rotino, Neem, um, Pyrethrum are um, common pesticides that are still used on organic food. If you truly want pesticide free food, you need to look for labels that say something certified pesticide free, uh, like pesticide residue free or never used pesticides. The problem with that is that food is actually hard to find. You would have to go to a like high end grocery store, Whole Foods, that kind of thing. Um, and it's even more expensive than just base organic food. So um, that's all I have for now. Um, hope you enjoyed it, and maybe you should enjoy some organic food or not. Kind of your choice.